All right, so I'm going to describe a solution I did here. Uh, this is actually a solution to problem 324 in the text. But uh, I'm not as much concerned with the actual solution of the problem as the approach I'm doing here. So uh, what we've been using MATLAB for in the past for solving these types of problems is we would basically write a very sequential MATLAB script file that would, you know, calculate the first element, then we would calculate the second element, and then the third element, uh, kind of all the time putting them into the global stiffness matrix and then solving, right? And so you can actually see that uh, the calculation of the element stiffness matrix is basically the same approach. The assembly of this global stiffness matrix is basically the same approach. The solution methods are all the same approach. And so obviously the temptation would be to write a program or a method of solving these problems in a bit more uh, general way. And so that's what I'm doing here. So I'm kind of basically setting up this solution pretty much like a standalone finite element code. I mean, I, I won't say general purpose, but it's, it's kind of close to it. So th this, the way we've solved this problem here actually should work for any uh, two-dimensional mesh of frame elements. And the same approach can be pretty easily extended for other types of elements, OK? Uh, so it's not like as general purpose as, say, NASTRAN, but it's much more general purpose than kind of what we've been doing in the past, all right? So if you remember the approach we were taking before, basically, we would um, initialize the global stiffness matrix. Uh, then we would assemble it, loop over, but basically for each element in the mesh, we would compute its element stiffness matrix and then scatter it into the global stiffness matrix. That's what's going on in this loop. Then we would solve, and then we would basically post-process, you know, step seven find the stresses and the strains. Or I should say the strains and then the stresses, right? And that approach really is the same for any of the problems we've done. So this solution here is um, doing that. You, you can actually run it. You know, you can download this problem off of Blackboard and you really don't have to do much to it. And just hit run. And assuming I'm in the right directory, I think it'll work, right? So uh, it's, it's still thinking. Oh, this is not. Python. So, okay, we'll change to that directory. And now we let it run. And you can see it runs. It writes out the results, like the nodal displacements, the reaction forces, and the stresses and the strains. And if I wait long enough, it will also eventually plot the window. It's a little slow. I don't know why, but it'll actually make like a little deformed plot of the elements. Let's see if that works. Still going. There it goes. Here we go. Yeah? Okay. So here's a deformed plot with a little bit of an exaggerated uh, deformation scale, but of the element. And and you can actually change this and run it for a different 2D truss problem. So uh, let me first discuss the uh, what's needed for the input. And then I might take a break there and then do a second half where I explain the code a little bit. Okay, so this program is has an input section, which you can see ends here where it says end of input at line 48, and then the rest of it, which is basically the program to solve it, right? And hopefully if I did this reasonably well, the bottom half, the, the code below where it says end of input, you really don't need to change if you want to solve a different problem, right? So this takes input uh, much the same way that NASTRAN does in the BDF file. So we have to define the nodes. We have to define how the nodes are connected to form elements. We have to define uh, material properties and properties of the elements, like cross-sectional area, Young's modulus. And we also have to say the boundary conditions, what nodes are fixed and what are the external forces, all right? And that's pretty much done here just in a couple of uh, data structures being set up in, in MATLAB. 
Okay, uh, we start off with our ubiquitous clear to just clear out memory if there's anything residual from, uh, from other um, programs. Uh, and the first thing I have here is a matrix that defines the nodal coordinates, okay? So each row defines the x and y coordinates of the node. So this is node 1, node 2, node 3, and node 4. And you can see from this problem that's the coordinates of node 1, 2, 3, and 4, all right? Now, the problem in the text gives it to you in feet, so I take this matrix and multiply it by 12, and that puts it into to inches, okay? Uh, so this, this is basically kind of like all those grid definitions in Nastran. All right, next we need to take those points and connect them up into elements. So we have uh, this connectivity matrix, or this con matrix. This again, each row is going to denote an element. And uh, for example, the first element connects node 1 to node 2, right? So that's connecting node 1 to node 2. It's this element. The second element connects node 1 to node 3. So this is node 1, and this is node 3. So it's this diagonal. The third element is 2 to 4. This is node 2 to this is node 4, so it's the other diagonal. The fourth element connects node 2 to 3, so that's uh, 2 to 3, so it's the up support on the right. The fifth one connects node 4 to 3, so this is 4 to 3, so it's the top element. And the last one connects node 1 to node 4, so it's this one. All right. So now we have a mesh. We've got the points. We've connected them with elements, okay? But now we still have to supply a couple more bits of information to define the mesh. We need to know what's the cross-sectional area of the elements, right? And also, what's the material stiffness, right? And this will allow us to define the element stiffness matrix fully for each element, all right? So this is pretty much the mesh, all right? Okay, the next thing we need to talk about are the boundary conditions, right? So there's two types of boundary conditions. One is describing the forces applied, and the other type of data structure is to describe what nodes are constrained, all right? So the simplest thing I find is to just actually define the force vector, the right-hand side force vector. So in this particular problem, I have four nodes. Each node has two degrees of freedom. So that means the force vector has to have eight rows, one column, okay? And basically, rows one and two correspond to the x and y force at the first node. Three and four correspond to the x and y force at the second node. Five and six, rows five and six, correspond to the x and y force at the third node. And rows seven and eight correspond to the x and y force of the fourth node. So you can see there's this mapping. And I probably should write it out, but I don't know if I have a way to write it out. It's very easily done here. Uh, well, I'll just write it out here as a line. <laughs> OK, let me just, this is not in the program, but I'm, uh, if, if you want to know um, which row, we'll call it r, a degree of freedom is, it's always going to be 2 times the node number, let's call it i, and minus 1 if it's the x degree of freedom. And then for a y degree of freedom, it's 2 times i, right? So node 5, its y degree of freedom is row 10. Its x degree of freedom is 9, right? So that's how you can kind of do this mapping, right? So that's pretty easy to do. And we'll use that later on as well, OK? Well, that's not part of the program, so there it goes. OK, so that pretty much sets up exactly uh, the force vector. So you can see the only external force that's applied here is an up force at node 3. So that's a force in the y direction of 1,000 pounds. So this is the third node. Its y degree of freedom is 2 times 3, or 6. So we put in 
in row 6, 1,000, right? So that makes F be, uh, you know, 1,000 pounds in the Y degree of freedom at node 3. All right, the last thing we need to do is describe which nodes are fixed. And actually, for this problem, I, I'm going to do the, the inverse of that, if you will. Instead of describing which nodes or degrees of freedom are fixed, I am going to say which degrees of freedom are free. And the reason why I do that is it's a little easier to just solve the reduced system like we've been doing in class, right? So we know that node 1 and 4 are fixed. So that's degrees of freedom 1 and 2 and 7 and 8 right? So that means all the other degrees of freedom are free. 3 and 4 and 5 and 6. 3 and 4 are the x and y degrees of freedom at node 2, and 5 and 6 are the x and y degrees of freedom at node 3. So these are the actual degrees of freedom of the uh, unconstrained degrees of freedom, right? So this is actually going to be the rows and columns that I'm going to solve for in my reduced system. So I'm going to solve rows and columns 3, 4, 5, 6, in the global stiffness matrix, okay? Again, using the same approach we've done before. All right, so, so that pretty much fully defines the input. Now, if you were to make another mesh, like for another problem, you would just have to go in here and redefine these same variables, keep the names the same, and you would have a solution, you know, basically you should execute it and you'll get results for that particular problem. Just the same way as uh, in NASTRAN, you don't have to rewrite NASTRAN, you just write a new input file. So this region here acts just like the BDF file, okay? All right, I'm gonna stop that there. Uh, and I think a good idea maybe is if you're interested to try and take another problem and see if you can solve it using this program, give it a different name and, and, and change the input section and then see how it works. Uh, uh, the next video, I'm gonna go through a little bit more about how we actually what's going on in the rest of the program, okay? Which for now, we're kind of just dealing with as a black box, okay?